on my estimation, based on open source platforms, there have been 33,748 murders in the city of Chicago since and including 1974, an average of about 675 per year. 33,748. Admittedly, now that exact number can be disputed, but not by much or by very many. 33,748, like the entire population of Beverly Hills, California. This year, 2024, at 3.30 a.m. on June 29th, will mark 50 years, nearly to the minute, since 25-year-old Becky Breedlove was stabbed to death in the bedroom of her apartment located on the second floor rear of 2025 West Erie Street on Chicago's near west side. One of 33,748 in that 50 years. Becky Breedlove, who moved to Chicago from Mississippi after college, likely seeking job opportunities or just the excitement often sought by young people from small town America coming to the big city. However, her journey began, it did not end well. Her murder remains open to this day, in danger of being lost to history, forgotten by all but what little family she has left, and the dwindling number of detectives who worked on her case. Swallowed up by the sheer amount of violence and murder that pounds on this city like waves against a seawall. But let's not let her fall to history so fast. We remember her, and hopefully you will too. This is the story of her case. Welcome back to Detective Story. I'm Mike Cameron. Thank you for checking in. We really appreciate the support and the overwhelming acknowledgement that we've gotten from people. We hope you continue to enjoy the show and uh, continue to give us feedback. This episode, I'd like to engage you in a real whodunit. Maybe you can help. I must say again, though, at this stage, I'm going to be discussing issues of extreme violence murder, domestic violence, proceed cautiously if those things upset you. That's part of what this is, but you should know ahead of time. So sometime in the period around 2002 to uh, 2003, I was approached by two detectives in Area 4 Homicide, whom I had gotten to know very well and respected a great deal. Joe Walsh and Richie Chernikovich, or Cherno and Walsh, as they were known in Area 4. Cherno and Walsh were go-to guys in Area 4. Experienced detectives who could be counted on to handle even the most challenging of cases. They also had an interest in always looking at the old cases, or cold cases, as they're called now, and particularly anything remotely related to the Chicago outfit. If you're not from or familiar with Chicago, we don't really use the term mafia too much, especially on the police department here. We call them crews or the mob, but most commonly the outfit. I had, I had been assigned to Area 4 Homicide in 2000, long enough by 2002 to have started to get over the sh shock of the sheer numbers of dead bodies that you encounter as a homicide detective in Chicago. Long enough to have gotten my ass handed to me in court by defense attorneys several times as I tried to navigate the much more complex and demanding job of report writing and testifying in homicide trials as compared to my prior six years as a patrolman. Also long enough to have started to build relationships with much more seasoned and wiser homicide detectives. Cherno and Walsh were certainly among that group, and they knew that I shared an interest in the old cases, especially the outfit cases. And we discussed the cases they knew often. Our lieutenant had been part of the famed Area 6 burglary unit and the old CIU and knew most of the outfit-related players going back 30 years. 
we had a lot of interesting conversations back then. And collectively, we had an idea of all the Area 4 cases going back to the early 60s that were or could potentially be outfit related. So in that time period, Cherno and Walsh spoke with me about a case that they had worked on that fell into that potential camp category, the case of Becky Breedlove. They gave me the file, and I proceeded to work on it until I retired. As I mentioned, Becky was 25 years of age. She worked for Capitol Records as a sales and inventory rep. She seemed to like the job and was well thought of. Her job, at a time when vinyl was at its peak, was to visit record stores in the Chicago area and check their inventory of Capitol Record albums and try to sell them more if necessary. She drove a 1972 Pontiac Le Mans that got her around comfortably. She, was, she also worked as a waitress at a restaurant called Stefano's, located at Chicago and Damon Avenue. Witness statements documented at the time that she was a cute, social person who liked to be out mingling with friends when she was not working. Maybe because of where she worked, or maybe just because she caught their attention in the neighborhood, she was known to spend time with several members of what was referred to as the Grand Avenue Crew, a well-known to law enforcement Chicago organized crime group that was part of the overall Chicago outfit. The area in which Becky lived and waitressed was fully within the Grand Avenue Crew's territory. The actual extent to which she knew and spent time with the crew, however, is unknown. At one point early in the investigation, detectives were approached by agents from the FBI who told them that they had an informant who had seen Becky in a bar with two of the Grand Avenue crew members, Charles Chucky Miller and Albert Alby Vena. The detectives interviewed Miller, who identified a photo of Becky as someone he had seen around the neighborhood, and he even stated he'd heard about her murder, but denied any direct knowledge and denied being with her and Alby Vena at any time. Becky also had an ongoing relationship with a man named Chester Sleva, who fathered her child. In interviews with detectives at the time, Chester Sleva stated that he was married, but had an approximate five-year extramarital affair with Becky, during which she got pregnant with his son. Sleva stated that the relationship was on and off, but he gave her $140 a month in child support. Sleva also admitted, and detectives confirmed, that his wife knew nothing of the affair with Becky. This will come up later, class. Becky's close and probably best friend at the time, Linda Gutierrez, told detectives that she had met Becky in college in Mississippi and Becky had followed her back to Chicago. Linda knew of her relationships and told detectives that she was so despondent and overwhelmed with having the baby with Saliva and his refusal to leave his wife that she sent her son to live with her parents back in Mississippi and checked herself into a mental health care facility. Linda stated that she also, meaning Becky, had a relationship with another married man named Nikki, Nicholas Nikki Salmo. She also met and dated a man in the mental health facility, but Linda stated that relationship was short-lived because the man was addicted to heroin and Be Becky was staunchly anti-drug use. An interesting night, a side note at this point here, her toxicology reports from her autopsy showed no traces of drugs and alcohol in her system at the time she was killed. So I'm afraid the picture I paint here may give the impression of a young, unstable, and poss possibly promiscuous young lady, but I would suggest there are other considerations. First, the time period. In 1974, our country was in the midst of a women's empowerment movement, and it was much more common for women to feel and be liberated of prior societal constraints. Potentially even more acute for a young woman from a small town in Mississippi now living in a large, exciting city. Additionally, although I'm not an expert on postpartum depression, it is clear with little research that though the condition had been discussed in various forms for centuries, it was not until the 1990s that it began to be taken seriously as a debilitating condition. Certainly, it seems likely that in 1974, Becky would have had little support if that was indeed causing her distress. Credit to her, in my mind, that she had the wherewithal at the time to seek treatment at all. Of course, it's not my job as a homicide detective to make any judgments about a victim's character. It's just pertinent information to determine the course of the investigation. In the end, whatever decisions Becky Breedlove made or didn't make 
could never have justified her murder. So to that, in the early morning hours of June 29, 1974, at 3.50 a.m., police officers responded to a call of a woman stabbed in the second floor rear apartment at 2025 West Erie Street. A quick review of the original handwritten patrol reports told me that the officers did exactly as they should have. They observed that the victim was clearly deceased, secured the crime scene, notified the detective division and crime lab personnel, and then conducted preliminary, preliminary interviews with witnesses on scene and held them there for investigative units to arrive. Detective units did arrive on the scene as, lo- as well as crime lab personnel. They noted the apartment to be neat, clean, and showed no apparent signs of struggle or fight which is still a bit odd to me and telling. Supported by crime scene photos, they noted Becky's body to be seated on the floor with her head and upper torso laying back on the bed. They noted stab wounds to her face near her right eye, chest, her back, and her vagina. Notably, they reported a small pool of blood near the wound on her vagina, but a large amounts of blood on the bed and a handprint in blood on the wall just above the bed. The scene was processed, and Becky's body was transported to the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office. At the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office, the attending medical examiner, along with attending detectives, discovered a men's Timex wristwatch entangled in Becky's long hair. And I'll tell you, the wristwatch was one of those old metal Timex stretchy band watches, you know. I remember my dad had them and and they always irritated me because they pulled the hair on my arm. And I always wondered why anybody wear a watch like this, you know, but I know they're very popular in that time period. And that's notable that it's wrapped in her hair. First of all, what kind of struggle was that, right? That the killer obviously loses his wristwatch and her hair fighting with her. Just an interesting note. During the autopsy, the medical examiner noted more than 30 stab wounds to Becky's chest, back, and body, including her vagina, and numerous contusions and abrasions about her neck and face. There were four long scratches located along the right midline about a half inch apart along her throat, meaning basically the middle of her neck as if someone had grabbed her neck in a fight. The medical examiner determined the cause of her death to be multiple stab wounds to the chest impacting both the heart and lungs and stated that the knife penetrated about four inches into the body. It is of note that they noted no what we call defensive wounds to her hands or arms. That sticks with me. Now, I'll get into that a little bit later, but that's just something that has always stayed with me. While on the scene of the crime, the detectives interviewed the three outcry witnesses, outcry meaning, you know, the first people to to, to call the police, report an event to the police. They were Helen Pakoulis, 44 years old, her daughter, Linda Pakoulis, who was 22, and Richard Calabrese, who's 37, who all lived in the 2025 Erie building. Helen Pakoulis, Becky's downstairs neighbor, related to the detectives, that about 1.30 a.m. she heard what she described as a dragging sound coming from the victim's apartment. About a half hour later, at approximately 2 a.m., she reported hearing a similar but louder sound. She then stated that about 3 a.m. she heard loud screams coming from the apartment, and at 3.30 a.m. she went upstairs to the apartment to the victim's rear door. She knocked on the victim's door at which time Helen Pakulis stated to the detective she heard a man whom she stated sounded like a Caucasian male yell out, if you open that fucking door, I will kill you. Helen Pakulis, being no fool, I guess, stated she returned to her apartment to call the police, and her daughter informed her that she had just seen a man creeping, her words, down the back stairs. Helen Pakulis then went back up to the victim's apartment, found the back door open, and walked in, and found the victim. So she was no coward, obviously. She then knocked on Richard Calabrese's door and told him what had transpired. The detectives interviewed her daughter, Linda Pakulis, who stated that she had seen a man who she knew as Chester leave the building with Becky earlier in the evening. She noted that he was wearing light-colored shirt and white or beige pants. 
She fur further stated that at some point during the night, she was awoken by her mother and heard screams herself coming from Becky's apartment. She said that her mother went upstairs to knock on Becky's door, but returned. And when she did, Linda reported to detectives that she had looked out of her bedroom window and saw a man walking or creeping quietly down the stairs. Though she claimed not to be able to see his face, she did state that he was wearing light-colored pants and a light-colored shirt. Richard Calabrese stated that somewhere in the area of 2 a.m., he was awoken by sounds of screaming, but looked out his front window and saw nothing and then fell back asleep. He said about 4 a.m., Helen Pakulis knocked on his door and told him that Becky had been stabbed. He told his wife to call the police, and he accompanied Helen Pakulis to Becky's apartment and saw she was indeed deceased. He then waited there for the arrival of the police. Also of note here was that the rest of the tenants of 2025 Erie were interviewed by detectives, and most admitted hearing screams but claimed to have seen nothing and took no action. The detectives were quickly able to identify Chester as Chester Sleva, as we discussed earlier, 31 years of age, and Becky's longtime boyfriend. An immediate search was conducted for him, but he was not found and interviewed until later in the day when detectives were notified by the Rolling Meadows, Illinois Police Department, that they had located Sleva after learning that he was wanted for questioning by Chicago police. When the detectives interviewed Sleva, he admitted the five-year relationship with Becky and fathering the son with her. Sleva stated that on the night of 28 June 74, he had arrived at Becky's house at 7 p.m. He stated that he and Becky had sex in her apartment and then later went to the Como Inn for dinner. They returned to her apartment about 10.15 to 10.30 p.m., and he shared a cup of coffee with her. Sleva stated that Becky wanted him to stay, but he told her that he knew she was seeing a guy named Nikki, who came over late, and he did not want a confrontation with him. How he comes about that information is unclear in any of the reports. Um, so that's an interesting side note as well. But he did tell detectives that Becky said that Nikki was not coming, and if he did, he always came very late. Sleva so stated that he left Becky's apartment at 11 p.m. and then arrived home about 11.45 p.m., immediately went to sleep, and then woke up at 5 a.m. to play golf. The detective separately interviewed Sleva's wife, Alice Sleva, who stated that she had no idea her husband had a relationship with Becky, but confirmed that he had come home at the time he said and gotten up to play golf, as he reported. They also showed Alice Sleva the watch recovered from Becky's hair, and she claimed to have never seen it before. Upon further questioning, however, Alice Sleva stated that on the night of Friday 28th, her husband had told her he had a business meeting and did not know when he would be home, and that she could not be sure about the exact time that he returned. Detectives, having identified Nikki, the other boyfriend, as Nicholas Salmo, went to Stefano's restaurant, where he either frequented or possibly even worked. I don't recall now. I don't recall seeing it in the reports. But they didn't find him there and interview him. He stated that on the 28th and 29th of June 1974, he was at home for a family member's birthday party, and he did not go out at all that night. He did admit to a relationship with Becky, but stated that he had not seen her since the 27th of June, two days prior. Also, though, on June 30th of June, 1974, detectives went to the home of Nicholas Salmo and interviewed his wife. His wife stated in that first interview that Salmo was indeed at home during the time he claimed up until about 10.30 p.m., at which time he showered and shaved. And she said she did not know if he had gone out after as she had gone to bed alone. Then on July 1st, 1974, just a few days after the murder, detectives went to 1924 West Grand Avenue where Nick Salmo was converting a uh, building to a hot dog stand uh, in order to re-interview him. He was not there, but his wife was. The detective spoke with her again, and this on this occasion, Ms. Salmo stated that she now recalled on the night of the 28th, June 74, at 10.30 p.m., he had showered and shaved as she had claimed, but now she recalled that he had come to bed with her and been home all night. 
Of course, this contrasted with her earliest, earlier statement. Detectives noted that in a report. With the inconsistencies in both men's stories, the detectives requested that Chester Sleva and Nicholas Salmo take a polygraph exam. Both agreed and took exams separately. Polygraph examiner at the time noted in his report some discrepancies in their stories or in their testing, but ultimately both passed the polygraph examinations, according to the examiner. Now, a note from Mike Hammond here, from my perspective and opinion, I'm not a big polygraph examiner guy myself. It's not to say that they're not effective. And people that are good with them, examiners that are good with them can be very, very good. They are not admissible in court um, for a reason. There, there are too many variables with them. Um, and over the course of, of my time as a homicide detective, to me, they were just a tool. If, if a suspect was asking for one, then I would always let them take it. In my mind, they were asking because they were lying anyway, generally. They didn't always prove out to be true, but it's not a tool that I particularly found effective or used all that much. And I, I just tell you that, and I don't mean to get every polygraph examiner in the world pissed off at me uh, because, you know, again, they can do a great job. Um, but I just tell you that now to tell you that based on the reports, that I recall reading from this polygraph ex examiner, I have no idea whether Chester Sleeve or Nicholas Salmo were telling the truth at all. And I don't know that it could be determined by the outcome of those two tests. It's possible they were, certainly. But uh, I was not then, and I'm not now convinced of that. So anyway, in following up with Becky's other known associates and trying to find a match for the bloody handprint located on the wall above Becky's body, the detectives literally interviewed a who's who of the Grand Avenue outfit crew. Junior Bavaria, Albie Vena, Chucky Miller, Carmi Sarlo, Pete Spina, Patrick Maruzars, the Hurtog brothers, Richie and Bobby, Bobby McAllister. And that's just to name a few. Ultimately, almost anybody who wasn't in custody at the time of the murder is known to be a member of that crew was interviewed and submitted palm prints uh, to be compared to to the, the the palm print handprint found on the wall. Ultimately, none at the time could be tied to a murder. In all fairness, I just want to make that clear at that point since I brought all that up. But it's a complicated matter, right? She was a small town girl in the big city, and she inadvertently or not put herself in a pretty precarious spot. I struggle with it all, to be honest. Some things seem obvious, and others not so much. Did the heartache with Sleva finally boil over and go horribly bad? It certainly sounds like a close match of him cre creeping down the back stairs after she was killed, and his wife's alibi for him wasn't exactly airtight. Did Nikki Salmo see Sleva leaving and get triggered into a killing rage? His wife's alibi was even worse directly contradicting herself two days after her first interview. Time to discuss it with him, for sure. Yet, they both pass polygraphs if you're prone to accepting those. And what about our Grand Avenue guys? If you never heard of them, you don't have to take my word. A little research online will tell you quite a bit. They were rough men capable of real violence, they were organized. They were very successful at times, uh, burglary, high-end, diamond thieves, capable men in this world of danger and violence, for sure. Does that mean they're involved? No, it does not. But the statement, open that fucking door and I will kill you, sticks with me. That sounds more like an experienced tough guy than a cheating husband to me, but that's my opinion. I don't know. The lack of defensive wounds, as I mentioned er earlier, that also bothers me. I mean, there are reasonable answers. Maybe the first blow was debilitating, or maybe she was overpowered or surprised and otherwise, or otherwise incapacitated. It's hard to say. Again, maybe leaning toward a more experienced killer, someone who knows his way around a blade, maybe. And finally, what of the evidence collected? The handprint, the watch with the stretchy band wrapped in her hair, the blood standards from her body. It's unusual for a knife attacker to attack that vi vehemently and not cut 
themselves and leave behind their own blood. It's not impossible, but it falls in the realm of unusual if true. But as to all that evidence, I'm afraid the answer will be as frustrating to you as it is to me. After years of searching for it in our cavernous Indiana Jones-like warehouse that is our evidence and recovered property section, I, nor any of the other people who worked on this case, have been able to locate any of the evidence. Now, Erbs has moved several times over the years, and the switching over from handwritten to computerized cataloging of, a, of evidence is a fairly new phenomenon. I really don't know. You know, I mean, we can extrapolate whatever we want out of that. But the truth is, I don't have an answer for it. I couldn't find it. I went through a lot of it. But there's a lot there. There is a lot of evidence collected in the last 100 years or whatever that is up there. And though they try and keep control of it and purge only things not related to murders and that, it's not the only case. So that's what it is. I do think it might be found someday, though. And that might solve this puzzle once and for all. So that's where I'll leave the case of Becky Breedlove, as I recall it, except for some closing thoughts in a moment. But first, I'd love to know your thoughts. Tell me your theory. Or ask me questions about things maybe I missed or glossed over that you wonder about. I'd like to get your input. I'd like to hear what you have to say about it. So, onward. We lost Richie Chernikovich this year to a heart condition. He was a fine detective and a funny, loyal, and warm-hearted man. Everyone that was lucky enough to know him will miss him. I got to see Cherno at another friend's wake a short time before he passed. He was clearly not well, but he was typically honest and humorous about his condition. We even joked about hijacking him, taking him south of the border, and finding an alley doctor to give him one last shot. Though his loss pains me, I'm thankful I got that conversation with him. I'll be able to conjure up that hearty laugh of his for the rest of my days. As to Becky Breedlove, it's an odd thing, I'll tell you. I was in my first year of Little League Baseball as a kid when she was murdered. I never heard her name or knew her story until 30 years or better after she was dead. But here's the deal with these old cases. When you get them handed down to you, when you decide you're going to look at them, when you stare at the crime scene photos over and over looking for something to give you help give you an answer not wanting to let it go not wanting them to be lost to history you know they become a part of you not to over dramatize that i know it sounds like but it just does all you have are the reports the detectives and family members who lived through it and still survive and of course those crime scene photos just hours and hours of staring at them as graphic and brutal as they can be, looking for something that will make it make sense or detail that might have been missed that will help solve the puzzle. I don't recommend that at all unless it's your job, I'll tell you that. But those photos, like Cherno's laugh, will always be with me. It's not a burden. I'm not crying a blues about that at all. I'm lucky and proud to have been able to try and help with Becky's case. I can live with it. I can't say that they brought me any answers, but they certainly helped keep me motivated. Motivated to work on it and motivated to keep her name alive. The killer may well be dead now, but as you've heard me say, you play the long game, right? Maybe the killer's still alive. Either way, I'm confident that someone survives who knows what happened. Someone who has carried the knowledge of the murder of this 25-year-old woman with a then year-and-a-half-year-old son for 50 years. That child is an adult now, and he deserves to know the truth. I spoke with him while I was researching this podcast. He, of course, remembers very little, but he has questions, and he deserves answers. Someone's out there carrying this burden. So I'm going to say directly to that person with the arrogance that maybe they hear this podcast, maybe you still lay your head every night beside the person who did it, and you have kept that burden for what? you believed were the right reasons. Or maybe you're afraid or just believed it was best not to get involved. It's not too late to make things right. But time keeps running, and someday your string will run out too. So ask yourself now, when your time comes, 
Are you going to have stood up for Becky and her son? Or are you going to carry that weight with you into eternity? Now, already in a few podcasts I've made, I've made it pretty clear I'm not a very religious guy, for better or worse, but I am a practical man. It could be that Satan himself is waiting for you to make a decision. Maybe he's hoping that you'll ignore me and go to him with your secrets. Maybe. My suggestion, lay that burden down while you still have time. If you have information about the murder of Becky Breedlove or knew her or would like to share your thoughts or just have questions, please feel free to email me at mike at detectivestory.net. It's mike at detectivestory.net. That address is in the show notes, too. Let me say, though, if you believe you have information directly regarding Becky's murder, please also call Chicago Police, now Area 3, Cold Case Homicide Unit at 312-742-2687 or 312-744-8261. I promise you there are guys and women, people there, to be happy to get that call. So that's all I got for today. If you're enjoying the show, please leave us a review. I'm figuring this out. It really does help. If you give us a good review, if you subscribe and download, we're all over the social media. It's also that stuff's in the show notes. I'd love to hear from you. I like the interaction. For better or worse, good and bad advice, I'll take it all. So until next time, be safe. And watch out for each other.